This is Bob. Bob is doing well. Very well indeed. That's because not long ago, with just a quick phone call, Bob realized that he could have something better in his life. And what did he get? Why, a big boost of confidence, a little more self-esteem, and a very happy Mrs. Ah, oh, the promise of harder, faster, bigger, longer, deeper, girthier. Who doesn't want more passion, pleasure, and vigor in their lives? Hi, everybody. This is T.C. Rollins and... Rain to Gray. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Dirty Talk podcast. This time around, we are looking at the fun, whimsical, weird, and wacky world of... False promises. No, yeah, well, yes, there's lots of false <laughs> promises that we'll be looking at. Plenty of false promises. <laughs> but these false promises usually have a name. People refer to these false promises as... Aphrodisiacs. Yes. Aphrodisiacs. Since the beginning of recorded history, humans have been searching and tried almost anything that might have the slightest chance of raising some libidinous desire. It is definitely something we've focused a lot of time and energy at over the millennia, for sure. It seems like whenever we come upon any new food, we're going to eat it in hopes that it might give us bigger erections or turn us on, put somebody in the mood, make somebody fall madly in love with you. Based on how many people we have on the planet, I don't think we need any higher libidos. I can't imagine how much more crowded things would be if aphrodisiacs were more effective. You know that pretty much everything you can imagine has been considered an aphrodisiac at one time or another? I realized that, and in the course of doing research for this podcast, I realized that even more. So there are the obvious ones like oysters, chocolate, chili peppers, strawberries, asparagus and rhino horn. The easies, yes. Those are the low-hanging fruit of aphrodisiacs. <laughs> right. However, did you know that people also once considered onions, carrots, potatoes, bacon, cheese, cucumbers, tomatoes, and mustard as aphrodisiacs? I knew of some on that list, and I feel like a lot of things got on that list based mainly on their phallic shape. That is one of the basic elements for something being an aphrodisiac is that it reminds you of genitalia, either something phallic or something that looks vaginal. Correct. To me, that list of ingredients just sounds like a decent sandwich. <laughs> or a really nice soup, a good vegetable soup. The reason why all these foods were considered to be aphrodisiacs at one time or another is because any time a new exotic food was introduced, it claimed to have aphrodisiac powers because it was just new and rare. As we've talked about before, any time you have novelty introduced, mm. it can change the situation and turn you on. So all mm. these things were considered aphrodisiacs until they became completely commonplace and you wouldn't go to your produce aisle right now and be like, oh, I'm just getting turned on amongst Look all these Look at that potato. Vegetables. Yes. At one point, potatoes were illegal as well. Correct. Yeah. That'll definitely give you some hard nipples when they're illegal. Ping, 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 ping. That's my hard nipple sound because they're really hard. Some things like basil, mint, cinnamon, cardamom, ginger, pepper, saffron, and vanilla were even banned in medieval times because they were being used in love potions, and there was concern amongst the church that they would make oh. people too randy. So oh. all these things that you have in your spice cabinet today, they were rare exotic spices coming from the East, and they were setting people's loins afire, so we couldn't have that, so we banned them. You got to keep your congregation with a very low, guilt-ridden libido so that they can focus more on the church and less on their loins. One interesting explanation for why some of these foods were also considered aphrodisiacs is because for most of human history, people had a very limited diet and they were pretty malnourished. So whenever a new food was introduced to a population, it gave them nutrients that they were lacking. And of course, they'd start feeling better and healthier and, then, and more oh. energized. 
And then when you're more energized, you're going to start banging. So it's not that it was an aphrodisiac. It's it was giving you needed nutrients. And now that you're not so close to the death by starvation, you're a little bit more into banging. Yeah, because most of the peasants were living hand to mouth. You had extremely limited mono diet. You would eat the same thing over and over again. And suddenly you get this thing, like an example is oysters, which uh, contain yeah. high levels of zinc, uh. which enables men to produce testosterone. And zinc deficiencies can lead to erectile dysfunction. So if you uh, eat some food that gives you a little extra pep or gives mm. you some needed nutrient that you don't have in your regular diet, what better way to spend that energy than between the sheets mm -hmm. or in the hayloft or pretty much any place you get a few moments of privacy? Besides humans' natural love of sex, there was another driving force compelling people to try every way possible to enhance fertility and virility. Is the, is the answer babies? It is babies. Procreation, hereditary titles, inheritance. Yeah. For most of human history, property and power was passed down through lineage. And woe be the person without an heir. Mm. And with mortality rates being fairly high, it was always best to just pump out as many heirs as possible because you had no idea which one was going to survive. Mm. So anything that might give you a little extra boost in the direction of producing more heirs was extremely highly prized. That checks out, for sure. However, beyond providing nutrition, none of the things we've mentioned so far have ever been proven to have any mechanism which boosts sexual desire and wantonness. Not even bacon? Are you sure? It's bacon. I mean, I get a little randy around some bacon. <laughs> so those things don't produce any sort of erotic manifestation in people. What does have an effect on people, like we were saying, is novelty, priming, and placebo. Mm. We've talked many times on this podcast how the brain is the biggest sex organ around. For sure. If you get the brain in line, everything else goes so much smoother. The yeah. brain is the most powerful, and people forget that. They neglect it all of the time. And basically, you're priming yourself. If somebody's told you, oh, this thing's an aphrodisiac, go eat some strawberries and chocolate, you're having this nice romantic dinner, what you're doing is you're priming yourself for what's going to happen after dinner because you're thinking about getting in the mood. You're thinking these foods are going to help. So, of course, the placebo effect's going to kick in and be like, oh, I've heard this stuff works, so... It should work, but we're also going through the pageantry of the foreplay. And then, of course, you're going to perform a little bit better later, and you'll attribute it to whatever you ate. Us humans really do like ritual. We find ritual very powerful and soothing. And it's helpful for us in a lot of ways. It is. We do now have things like Viagra and Cialis which have a real demonstrable ability to help with erections, but pretty much anything else that claims to turbocharge your sex life, give you better orgasms, or add length and girth to your love wand is pretty much just hope in a bottle. People will pay a lot of money for hope in a bottle. You've seen me do it plenty of times. I have seen you spend hundreds of dollars of hope in a bottle. I'm full of hope. This brings me back to where we started with Smiling Bob. For those of you who have never had the pleasure of seeing one of the commercials, which we started with, you're lucky because they were pretty much inescapable in the early 2000s. Bob was shilling a product called Enzite. I remember Enzite. Bob was very, very cheerful, and everybody seemed to like Bob. That was his shtick, is that he was always smiling and they were always using some sort of euphemism to let you know that something's going on with Bob to make him happy all the time. And his wife seemed extra happy as well. boo -ya. Did you know that Enzite didn't originally start out as Enzite? It started out as something else? Yes. When the company behind it first entered the market for natural supplements that would give your sex life an assist, they promised that you would come like a raging bull from their product, Trinitin, a powerful sexual intensifier 
developed in Pamplona, Spain. The ad urged customers to watch your lover's astonished look as you shoot power-packed globs Uh, of cum up to 13 uh, feet away. No, it does not. No, I refuse power-packed globs of cum up to 13 feet away. I... That cannot be the copy. I don't know. I will show you my evidence if you would like. You're just, you're fire hosing the room. I'm sure there are many a porn star out there that wish they could shoot a load 13 feet across the room. They that would, they would have famous the, the career to end all careers. No, they would be living in a mansion rubbing caviar on their nipples. Uh, but I've never seen it. Like that's, hmm, it's almost like perhaps that's implausible. Yeah, well, they were selling these products in the back of magazines that weren't the most reputable places to find things. These are the kind of magazines that people tend to read one-handed, if you know what I mean. I'm following you, yes. But the real breakthrough for the company came once Viagra hit the market and started bringing some actual validity to Uh... ED products. Right. So they could move out of the back pages of certain rags. It was a stroke of genius for the company when they renamed it to sound like a drug. Mm. Not like Trinitan, but Enzite sounds like something your doctor might prescribe to you. It does. They gave it fancy new packaging, made their pill look almost identical to this new product that everyone was talking about that had just hit the market that was giving Uh, people rock hard erections. Okay. Okay. And they started printing up glossy brochures touting its effectiveness and marketing it as an alternative natural male enhancement. Their ploy there being, oh, it's not a drug. It's all natural ingredients, but it's basically what they're suggesting is it does the same thing that Viagra does. That's quite clever. And it's just marketing. It went from shooting 13 feet of gobules of cum against a wall to suddenly changing the packaging, changing the shape, changing the label. Humans really are suckers for packaging and marketing. It's very powerful. It leads into the placebo effect. It's true. It's all how you present it. And Enzite has the exact same number of letters in it as Viagra, which oh. I was reading may not be a coincidence. I don't. Th- pr- it, I doubt they did so much other marketing that wouldn't be a coincidence. That would be part of it. Of course, they started the whole ad campaigns and all those cheesy smiling Bob commercials kind of did look like bad drug commercials from the same time. Yes, they did. Indeed. So you might wonder what exactly was in Enzite. Um, horny goat weed. Yes. (gasps) I was right. I just pulled that out. (laughs) So we got ginseng, grape seed extract, horny goat weed, zinc, potency wood, (laughs) ginkgo biloba, niacin, and copper. You probably recognize a lot of these ingredients because they show up in almost every gas station boner pill on the market. But you know that those pills you get in the gas station also have a secret ingredient not listed on the label. Is that legal? I thought that was illegal. They can't do that, can they? It is not necessarily legal, but since they are marketed as nutritional supplements, they aren't up to FDA scrutiny. A secret ingredient not listed. Is it cocaine? It is it's not, cocaine. It's not cocaine. All right. Do you think they're going to pay to put cocaine in these pills? Those pills I, I, would be. You said it was a secret ingredient. I just, yes. I mean, okay. How expensive do you think those pills are? I am sorry that I have not purchased enough gas station boner pills to be in the know for the going range for it. I apologize. I will pay more attention next time. The secret ingredient not listed on the label is either Viagra or Cialis. No, no. Yes. Yes. Wait, what? Illegally purchased? Or I'm full of questions. If you go to the FDA's website, there is a never ending list of these pills. You will probably recognize some of them. They're like Rhino 355 or, you know, Wild Mustang. Pretty much anyone that you've seen in any sex shop or any gas station 
is on the FDA list. They just keep coming out with them since oh. they are labeled as nutritional supplements. They don't have to go through FDA approval. So they put all these ingredients in there, but they also slide in some Viagra because that's what's actually it's working. Really working. Oh. And then the FDA will get their hands on them after they've been out for a little while. And I will put a link to the FDA website where it lists all these pills and it's every couple of days. There's just a new alert. Hey, warning. There is this drug that's in it. That's not on the label. And it's usually the main ingredient in Viagra or the main ingredient in Cialis. So whenever they get caught, they just make a new one. Yeah. They just relabel okay. it and be like, Oh no, right. it's a, you know, it's got a bunch of horny goat weed and other stuff. Mm. It's got potency wood. <laughs> okay. So do you think Enzyte worked? No. No is the correct answer to that question. Despite the manufacturer's claims that Enzyte will increase penis size, girth, and firmness and improve sexual performance, there exists no scientific evidence that Enzyte is capable of making good on these claims. In fact, Enzyte has never been scientifically tested by the FDA or other independent third party. Do you think it mattered if it worked or not? Uh, it certainly didn't matter to their bank account, did it? It I didn't mean, because they sold hundreds of millions of dollars, dollars of right. wishful thinking to right. all these people. So, of course, they were sued in 2004 because the product was ineffective and it didn't follow through on any of its marketing claims because nothing is going to grow your dick size. But hope. Well, it's surgery. <laughs> But, you know, the company didn't care if the product worked or not because they had another play in the works. Ooh, which is? In 2006, the owner of the company was indicted for conspiracy, money laundering, and mail, wire, and bank fraud. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Here's what the charges claim was that the company was preying on individual shame and embarrassment. They were banking oh. on some men being too uncomfortable to talk about their sexual dysfunction with their doctor, but they could anonymously order this product that was claiming mm. to be as good as Viagra over the phone or online. They mm. could even get a free trial. They only needed to pay for shipping. So the company would get their credit card number, but then start billing them monthly whether they signed up or not. Oh. They were then assuming that these same men would be too embarrassed to dispute the charges because they would have to call their credit card company and be like, no, I wasn't ordering any dick pills. So I don't know what oh. these charges are on Those there. Those sneaky bastards. The owner was found guilty and went to prison in 2008, but was released in 2020. What do you think happened to the company and the product? Well, I would think rightfully it should have been dissolved. But because you're asking, I'm thinking it had to somehow exist and be relaunched in some way. Oh, yeah. They both still exist and they're around today. The company changed its name and you can still buy Enzite pretty much anywhere from Amazon to Walgreens to CVS. And it's about 50 bucks for a one month supply. So it doesn't work. A bunch of people got sued. But you can just, if you want to pay 50 bucks for hope in a bottle, certainly. They're not stopping you. Basically, my point is, even after all that, there are still people willing to shill out their hard-earned money for something that has been proven to be ineffective. As hope. long as there hope. are people on this planet, there will be people looking for anything that might give sexy time a little kick in the pants. That being said... We want to thank you for joining us as we explore the weird world of aphrodisiacs and some of the mishaps they've caused for hopeful humans. Serious mishaps. Buckle up. I know this is a podcast about aphrodisiacs, so it might seem odd that you're about to encounter a serial killer. What do serial killers have to do with aphrodisiacs? Nothing, one might say. They would be wrong. Buckle up for the tale of Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. That is Neil with two L's, naturally. 
No, not that kind of cream, you filthy skin beast. Get your mind out of the gutter. Or keep it there. We here at the Dirty Talk Podcast are a judgment-free zone. You do you. As long as you are not a serial killer. The notorious Dr. Neil Cream was born in Glasgow and attended McGill University in Montreal, graduating with an MDCM degree in 1876. His thesis topic was chloroform. Pay attention to the chloroform because it will be important later. Fellow students noticed that Cream had a fevered interest in chloroform and other drugs that desensitized patients. He then went for postgraduate training at St. Thomas's Hospital Medical School in London, and in 1878 obtained additional qualifications as a physician and surgeon. As dedicated a man of science as this resume may make him appear to be, his first and truest passion was women. On one hand, he craved them sexually, constantly drawn to them, as many as possible. He seemed fascinated and yet simultaneously perplexed, frightened, and hateful of them. He was drawn to upper-class and refined women as a preference, despising with a fiery passion lower-class, coarse women particularly sex workers that he felt were responsible for luring men into a life of sin. It is always the woman's fault for being so tempting, isn't it? His desire to sample as many flowers as possible is how he ended up unwillingly married to a Flora Brooks. After getting her pregnant, he performed an abortion on her that went poorly and then fled town. Eventually, the poor teenager confessed to the town physician what the true cause of her ongoing issues were, and her relatives tracked Dr. Cream down for a hasty marriage at gunpoint. He agreed, unwillingly, and returned to town just long enough for a honeymoon before slipping away again. More ladies to love and the bonds of matrimony were not for him. He set his eyes on London and murder. In August 1879, Kate Gardner, a woman with whom he was alleged to have had an affair, was found dead, pregnant and poisoned by chloroform. Told you that chloroform was going to be important later on. Cream claimed that she had been made pregnant by a prominent local businessman, but after being accused of both murder and blackmail, Cream fled to the United States blackmail, or attempted blackmail, as he was never particularly successful at it, was one of Dr. Cream's favorite activities. It has been proposed as a theory that when in the company of a loose woman, as opposed to the high-born, refined ladies, Dr. Cream may have been unable to perform without the use of drugs. Intimidated and fearful of impotency, he manifest a loathing for anything that should have but failed to arouse him. Certainly, he did believe in the power of aphrodisiacs. In a time before Viagra, he was in the habit of taking pills, which, he said, were compounded of strychnine, morphine, and cocaine, and of which the effect, he declared, was aphrodisiac. At the time, it was believed that in small doses, strychnine was an effective aphrodisiac. The only problem is that in slightly larger doses, it killed. In Cream's case, the morphine and cocaine probably weren't doing him any favors. During the Victorian era, doctors recorded a case in which a male patient aged 25 years had only been able to engage in what they referred to as fraternal communication with his wife. Fraternal means no banging. After 18 months of this, the patient was given strychnine, with the patient finding the drug effective. 
Additionally, the patient noticed that the benefit the drug provided ceased when he stopped taking it. As long as he was taking a lethal poison, there was some lead in the old pencil. No rat poison, no lead. While strychnine generally stopped being used for such purposes, what with the risk of death and all, in the 1960s, a company in Miami learned of strychnine's supposed sexual benefit from medical writings of the Victorian era. The company, All Products Unlimited, hoped to seize upon the sexual revolution of the 1960s for financial gain by selling an aphrodisiac pill they called Gems. The pill, marked as a sex energizer pep tablet for married men and women, contained a small dose of strychnine. Following the release of gems to the general public, All Products Unlimited was sued for mail fraud. The suit was not focused on the inclusion of strychnine in the pill's formula, but instead focused upon the false claims of Jim being able to provide sexual benefit to consumers. Upon facing the charges in court, the company decided not to fight it and was swiftly indicted. Strychnine is not an effective aphrodisiac. You heard it here at the Dirty Talk podcast. Back to the good doctor. Cream established a medical practice not far from the red light district in Chicago, offering illegal abortions to prostitutes. He was investigated in August 1880 after the death of Mary Ann Faulkner, a woman upon whom he had allegedly operated but he escaped prosecution due to lack of evidence. In December 1880, another patient, Miss Stack, died after treatment by cream, and he subsequently attempted to blackmail a pharmacist who had filled the prescription, again with the blackmail. On July 14, 1881, Daniel Stoat died of strychnine poisoning at his home in Boone County, Illinois, after cream supplied him with an alleged remedy for epilepsy. The death was attributed to natural causes, but Cream wrote to the coroner blaming the pharmacist for the death after again attempting blackmail. This time, Cream was arrested, along with Mrs. Julia A. Stott, who had become Cream's mistress and procured poison from Cream to do away with her husband. She turned state's evidence to avoid jail, laying the blame on Cream, which left him to face a murder conviction on his own. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in Joliet Prison. Life in prison does not mean life in prison if you have the right connections and wealth. In Dr. Cream's case, life in prison ended up being 10 short years. He was released in July 1891. Governor Joseph W. Pfeiffer commuted his life sentence after Cream's brother pleaded for leniency and allegedly, bribed the authorities. Using money inherited from his father, Cream sailed for England, arriving in Liverpool in October 1891. Back to his old hunting grounds. A fact that would end poorly for multiple women. And in just a handful of weeks, he was a man on a mission and burning with rage at his ten lost years, lost on the altar of unreliable, fickle females that needed to be punished, and punished severely. On October 13th, 1891, Ellen Donworth, a 19-year-old prostitute, accepted a drink from cream. She was severely ill the next day and died on October 16th from strychnine poisoning. During her inquest, cream wrote to the coroner offering to name the murderer in return for a 300,000 pound reward. On October 20th, Cream met with a 27 year old prostitute named Matilda Clover. She became ill and died the next morning. Her death was at first attributed to her alcoholism. Cream wrote a note to the prominent physician, Dr. William Broadbent, accusing him of poisoning Matilda Clover and demanding cash. On April 2nd, 1892, after a vacation in Canada, Cream was back in London 
where he attempted to poison Louise Harvey, who, being suspicious of him, pretended to swallow the pills he had given her. She secretly disposed of them by throwing them into the River Thames. Her suspicions saved her life, and it was eventually her courtroom testimony that sealed the good doctor's fate. On April 11th, Cream met two prostitutes, Alice Marsh and Emma Shrevel, and talked his way into their flat where he offered them bottles of Guinness. Both women died in shrieking agony. Through his accusatory letters and multiple attempts at blackmail, Cream succeeded in drawing close attention to himself. It is often a fact that murderers are compelled to draw attention to themselves from writing letters to inserting themselves in police investigations to being underfoot at crime scenes. Whether this is from a subconscious desire to be caught and stopped or a thrill at believing they are simply too smart to be caught is anyone's guess, but Dr. Cream was no exception and made himself painfully obvious. Not only did the police quickly determine the innocence of those accused, but they noticed something in the accusations made by the anonymous letter writer. They referred to the murder of Matilda Clover. In fact, Clover's death had been registered under natural causes related to her drinking problem. The police realized that the false accuser who had written the letter was the serial killer referred to in the newspapers as the Lambeth Poisoner. Not long afterward, Cream met a policeman from New York City who was visiting London. The policeman had heard of the Lambeth Poisoner, and Cream eagerly took it upon himself to give a tour of where the various victims had lived, going over everything in great and glowing detail. The American policeman found his actions so suspicious, he shared his concerns to a British policeman. Tipped off, the police at Scotland Yard put Cream under surveillance and soon discovered his habit of visiting prostitutes. They also contacted police in the United States and learned of their suspect's conviction for a murder by poison in 1881. On June 3rd, 1892, Cream was arrested for the murder of Matilda Clover, and on July 13th, he was formally charged with the murders of Clover, Donsworth, Marsh, and Travell, the attempted murder of Harvey, and extortion. His trial lasted from October 17th to the 21st. After a deliberation lasting only 12 minutes, the jury found him guilty of all counts and he was sentenced to death. Less than a month after his conviction, on November 15th, Cream was hanged on the gallows at Newgate Prison. As was customary with all executed criminals, his body was buried the same day in an unmarked grave within the prison walls. Thus ends the story of frustrated ladies' man and hapless blackmailer Dr. Thomas Neal C. Cream. Stay away from the strychnine, folks. It's not going to give you the results you are seeking. That's another Dirty Talk podcast PSA for you all. Don't get too down on yourselves, boys. Hillcrest High is one of the toughest teams in our division, and we can't win them all. Y'all had some great hustle out there this afternoon. And remember that every loss is just an opportunity to do better next time. We'll see him again in a month. And I have no doubt that we'll knock the cover off the ball. Now hit the showers. You got right, it, coach. coach. On it, coach. All right. Hey, Andy. Yeah, coach? Hold up a second. I want a word with you. Sure thing. What is it, coach? What the hell was that pitching out there today? Looked like your arm was made out of wood. You couldn't hit the strike zone for nothing. You've been throwing lights out all season. What gives? Yeah, I'm real sorry, coach. I, I know you and the other guys were counting on me out there. I-, I just couldn't keep my head in the game. I'll do better next start, I promise. Something on your mind, son? You having personal issues? 
You know, if you ever need to talk, my door is always open. I appreciate it, Coach. I've just been thinking about stuff lately. I think I've got an idea about what's going on. It's girls, isn't it? I must have seen a hundred boys your age go through the same thing. It's girl trouble, isn't it, Andy? No, it's got nothing to do with girls. Look, if I tell you, Coach, you promise it'll stay between the two of us? Of course. I won't say a peep to no one. Unless you're aiming to hurt yourself or someone else. And then I'm mandated by the state to say something. Gee whiz, no. I don't want to hurt anybody. The thing is, I got a situation with Eddie. Eddie the catcher? You and Eddie having problems with each other? No, things have been going great with Eddie and me. The thing is, we've been seeing each other for the last couple months, and I'm really into him. His parents are going to be away this weekend, and we've been thinking about me staying over at his house and going all the way. It's not that I don't want to, I really do. It's the only thing I've been able to think about all week. It's just that we've never done this before, and I'm worried about letting him down if, you know, I can't perform. I couldn't stop thinking about it during the game. He'd give me signals for the pitches, and I get so nervous thinking about him, I just keep screwing him up. I see. Well, Andy, if Eddie likes you as much as you like him, then I guarantee it won't matter to him if you grand slam, bunt, or strike out. Anyone worth your time will understand if your first time doesn't go off without a hitch. Oh, this isn't my first time. I've had sex with a bunch of other boys. Yeah, you have. Yeah, But it's different with Eddie. I really like him, and I want this to be a long-term thing. That's why I've been taking it slow. I guess I just wasn't as nervous with the other guys because I didn't like him as much. I just want everything to go perfect with Eddie. Huh. Well, don't put too much pressure on yourself. What I always say is that pressure is a hard-on's arch-nemesis. But if you want an insurance policy... You can always take an aphrodisiac to relax and get in the mood. An afro what? You know, an aphrodisiac. Named after Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love? No, I don't know anything about that, coach. Well, it's a food, drink, or substance that boosts desire. It ups your excitement level, stokes the fires, gets them burning hot, corks your bat, if you know what I mean. That sounds great. Where do I get my hands on one of these aphrodisics? That's aphrodisiac. You can find them all over the place. Almost everything's been considered an aphrodisiac at one time or another. You know what? You should go down to that Chinese herbalist downtown. You know, the one catty corner to the Dairy Queen? Yeah. Well, go in there and ask for some Yatsa Gumbu. That'll fix you right up. Yards gumbo? Yards of gumbo, or caterpillar fungus. Some people call it the Viagra of the Himalayas. What is it? Oh, it's a cordyceps fungus that only grows inside the body of the caterpillar of the ghost moth. See, what happens is this caterpillar will bury itself a couple inches into the soil. Meanwhile, it doesn't know it But this fungus is digesting it from within and slowly mummifying it. Then in the spring, this tissue erupts from the head, making a little fungus sprig that people use to pull the caterpillar out of the ground and then sell it as an aphrodisiac. It's kind of rare, though, because it can only be found 13,000 feet up in the mountain plateaus. So you think eating this Tibetan fungus mummified caterpillar will help me with my worries about having sex with Eddie? Well, it couldn't hurt. Actually, it could. The fruiting body of the fungus is high in arsenic, so you don't want to eat too much. But some people swear by it. Also, bring in a decent amount of money with you because it costs tens of thousands of dollars a pound. I don't have that kind of money, Coach. You don't, huh? Then I guess you wouldn't have enough money to buy any ambergris either. What's ambergris? It's 
basically sperm whale gallstones. See, the whales like to eat squid, but the squid beaks are indigestible and they irritate the whale's intestines. So, as they pass through the whale, a hard waxy stuff is formed around the beaks and then the whale eventually poops it out. It floats around in the ocean for a while, gets weathered by the sea, basically ages like a fine wine. It then washes up on the beaches where people find it. It looks like a brownish gray rock. And people eat this stuff? Oh yeah, they have for millennia. They also use it in some of the most expensive perfumes and burn it in religious ceremonies. It's long thought to have a strong sexual power. In fact, King Charles II, one of England's most hedonistic kings, used to love to eat eggs and ambergris for breakfast. And Casanova would add it to his chocolate mousse to get him in the mood. Back in the 90s, they did this study with rats where they gave them Ambrian, one of the main compounds in ambergris, and they found that it acted as a potent sexual stimulant. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds great and all, Coach. And I do like Eddie, but I don't know if I like him enough to eat whale poop. Gotcha. Well, even if you did, like I said, the stuff is pretty expensive. And it's technically illegal in the U.S. Hmm, let me think. Do you happen to know any Sardinians? Not that I know of, but, but I can ask around. If you do, see if they're willing to give you some Kasamatsu. Katsu what? Kasamatsu. It basically translates to rotten cheese. It's a traditional Sardinian delicacy that they find to have aphrodisiac properties. Okay, so I find a Sardinian and ask him for some rotten cheese and then eat it before I go to Eddie's house? Yeah, that's the plan. Just be careful when you eat it, because the maggots and the cheese can jump pretty high. So it's a good idea to cover your eyes while you're eating the cheese. You definitely don't want to get maggots in your eyes. There are maggots in the cheese? Yeah, the maggots are what make it special. Otherwise, it would just be regular old sheep's cheese. You see, after the cheese is aged normally, part of the rind is cut away so the cheese fly can enter and lay its eggs. It's then left for a couple of months so the eggs can hatch and the maggots can begin to eat the cheese. The acid from the maggots' digestive system breaks down the cheese fats and makes the cheese soft and have a real pungent taste. Just make sure if you find some of this cheese, don't eat it if the maggots have died. That's how you know the cheese has gone bad and isn't safe to eat. No offense, Coach, but I don't think eating maggot-infested cheese will necessarily put me in the mood. Well, it's definitely not for everyone. You know what? I think I have a recipe here from this 11th century monk and physician named Constantinus Africanus. Let me find that book. All right, here we go. I think this might be exactly what you might need. He says this is exactly what you need to provoke desire and can cure an impotent man. All right, here we go. Now pay attention. You take the brains of 30 male sparrows and you steep them for a really long time in a glass pot. Take an equal amount of the grease surrounding the kidneys of a freshly killed billy goat, dissolve it on the fire, and then add the brains and as much honey as needed. Mix it in a dish and cook it until it becomes hot. Make into pills like filberts and give one before intercourse. Where am I going to find 30 male sparrows before tomorrow night? Yeah, we are under a bit of a time crunch, aren't we? All right, let me think. There's got to be something I'm not thinking of. Uh, hey, Coach? Yeah? How do you know all this stuff? You may not know this yet, Andy, but every adult you know has two different lives. One that you see, and one that you necessarily don't. 
Take Miss Paget, the librarian. She seems like a nice, demure old woman, doesn't she? Yeah, I guess. I've never given it much thought. I, I mean, she's just Miss Paget. Well, it might surprise you to find out that when she was younger, she was a professional wrestler who went by the name Junkyard Lolita. Now she spends her weekends doing roller derby so she can get out all that pent-up anger and aggression from having to tell kids to be quiet all day and messing up her Dewey Decimal cards. Oh, and Mr. Glover, who works down at the pharmacy soda fountain? Do you know that he spends his free time building intricate miniature cities in his garage, which he populates with gerbils and rules over them like a god? And Deputy Beck? Do you know what a gasper is, Andy? No. Well, that's not important. You'll find out when you're older. My point is, there is a lot about people you never see. Most people's lives go much deeper than their day-to-day busy work. As for myself, I like to practice alchemy at home in the evenings. I'm also an apprentice hallucinogenic shaman to Mr. Derrickson, the math teacher. We've built a makeshift sweat lodge down in the boiler room if you ever want to come and join us for a vision quest. Um, I'm good. I've got it. Before you go to Eddie's house, eat a bunch of hummus. You think hummus will help me with my problem? Yeah. According to this 400-year-old book I've been reading, chickpeas were the holy grail of semen producers. Back then, for food to be considered beneficial for semen production, it had to meet at least one of three different requirements. It should be warm, moist, or windy. And chickpeas check all those boxes. The gassier the food made you, the more it would increase your libido because it was believed that flagellants was what gave men erections. So I should eat a bunch of hummus and other gassy foods before I go to Eddie's tomorrow night? It's worth a shot. If Galen says it's good for you, then who am I to argue? Hey, Andy! You gonna come shower or what? Yeah, I'm coming. Just give me a sec. Uh, thanks, Coach. I really appreciate the talk. I'll try not to worry too much about it. Anytime, kid. That's what I'm here for. But next game, I want to see some extra hustle out of you. I want to see those pitches coming in hard and fast. No problem, coach. Thanks for helping me get my head back in the game. You're welcome. Now go hit the showers. Despite what the Beastie Boys might have to say on the subject... Spanish fly is actually incredibly dangerous to the point of lethality and is not the magic potion aphrodisiac that some wish it to be, as Arthur Kendrick Ford found out the hard way, along with two unfortunate young women. In 1954, Arthur Ford was working as an office manager at a chemical manufacturer in London. Despite being married and a father, Arthur had fallen hard very hard, for a certain Miss Betty Grant, one of the young women in his office. For her part, Miss Grant was less enthusiastic about any possible games of hide the sausage, and in Ford's words, kept putting me off. It couldn't be because a woman in her 20s had no interest in a married man that was literally old enough to be her father. No, that couldn't be it. It had to be that she was frigid and needed to be loosened up with a little of that old Spanish fly. During the course of work, Ford regularly saw the names of chemicals on orders that passed through his office, but he was not a chemist or a pharmacist, and so they had little meaning for him. They were just names of products sold by his company. One day, a query came into the office about Cantharidian, the principal component of Spanish fly. Ford had heard of Spanish fly's reputation as an aphrodisiac, but up until then had not known the chemical name was Cantharidian, or that his company kept a quantity of it in their stores. The Spanish fly is an emerald green beetle in the blister beetle family. The insect is the source for the terpenoid Cantharidian, a toxic blistering agent. The defensive chemical Cantharidian, for which the beetle is known, is produced only by males. 
Females obtain it from males during mating, as the spermatophore contains some. This may be a nuptial gift that increases the value of the male in the female's eyes. Cantharidin, the principal active component for preparations in Spanish fly, was first isolated and named in 1810 by the French chemist Pierre Robiquet, who demonstrated that it was the principal agent responsible for the aggressively blistering properties of this insect's egg coating. Cantharidin can cause severe chemical burns on exposure to skin or soft tissue. Why such an unpleasant compound should have such a reputation as an aphrodisiac is a bit of a mystery, but it may be because cantharidin causes dilation of blood vessels allowing increased blood flow. Helpful for one specific organ, perhaps, but hardly worth the intense irritation and blistering it causes. When ingested, cantharidin can be fatal in doses as low as 10 milligrams. The same blistering effects seen on the skin can cause severe hemorrhaging to the intestinal tract. The effects are vomiting, darkened urine, and bloody stools. It causes irritation, blistering, bleeding, and discomfort. There is no antidote. Death is painful and rapid. Arthur Ford was warned by one of the pharmacists on the day he went to the stores and inquired about cantharidin. He was told in no uncertain terms it was dangerous, a number one poison. And Ford replied, In that case, I better not have it. Despite the warning, and unfortunately for two young women, Ford crept back into the stores when he had a chance and stole a quantity of the drug. An inventory later revealed that 39 grains, approximately 2.5 grams, or enough to kill over 200 people, was missing. The next day, on April 27, 1954, Ford bought a bag of coconut ice on his way back from lunch. It was not unusual for Ford to buy sweets for his staff, and nobody suspected anything when he began to distribute the coconut ice to the staff at his office. Somewhat unusually, he picked up individual squares and handed them directly to people rather than letting them make their own choice from the bag. Betty Grant received a piece, and so did a Miss Scammell and a Miss Glover. No one could remember Miss Mallins being offered a piece, but several people recalled her eating a square. Arthur Ford also ate some of the sweets. At around 3.30 p.m., Miss Mallins complained of stomach pains, and Miss Grant helped her upstairs to the sick room. At this point, Miss Grant was showing no ill effects and went back to work. But about half an hour after Miss Mullins went to the sick room, Miss Grant joined her. Arthur, careless first-time poisoner that he was, was also seen to be unwell and lying on the floor of his office. A doctor was called in and declared that Miss Mullins, Miss Grant, and Mr. Ford all required hospital treatment. The condition of the two women deteriorated rapidly, and they both died. Arthur recovered, no doubt because he did not accidentally consume as much of the lethal substance. Such unusual deaths meant that a post-mortem examination was carried out. The post-mortem revealed that cantharidin was in both bodies around 10 times the lethal dose. Even if the doctors had realized the cause of their illness at the time, there was nothing that could have been done to save the women. Their fate was sealed once the coconut ice had passed their lips. Would-be Casanova Ford was quickly found out and confessed to his actions. He stood on trial for a charge of manslaughter and pleaded guilty. Luckily for him and his determined boner that was willing to kill to get its way, he was only sentenced to five years imprisonment, a light penalty indeed for two lives. There is no substance that will effectively make the object of your desire offer up their genitals to you. If there was, everyone would be using it. Alcohol is the closest thing we have yet discovered in terms of an effective aphrodisiac, but for everyone's sake, stay away from the Spanish fly. <laughs>